This is the almost timely newsletter for June 25th, 2023. Seven months to Christmas. Content authenticity statement. 92% of this newsletter was generated by me, the human. AI-generated content appears in the first section in the form of two images and a paragraph of text. What's on my mind this week? When should you use generative AI? Today, let's talk about when to use or not use generative AI to create content. There are three sets of factors we need to consider to make this decision. First, is the, a the effort AI-assisted or AI-led? This makes a difference as the final product ultimately made by humans or machines. Second, is the task at hand generative or comparative? Generative AI, both large language models that power tools like ChatGPT and image tools like Stable Diffusion, are better at one versus the other. Third, is the content being created a commodity or is it premium? These are the three tests. Let's explore what each of these mean. First, AI-assisted versus AI-led. This first test is pretty straightforward. AI-assisted content is when you ask an AI model to help you create, but you, the human, are ultimately the creator. Examples of AI-assisted content would be things like writing an outline, brainstorming, giving suggestions, asking advice. AI is the helper, and you are the doer. AI-led content is content in which the machine's output is a substantial part of the final product. Examples of AI-led content would be writing a detailed prompt that the machine creates a blog post for, or creates a series of images you use in a slide deck, or writes a jingle that you use in a YouTube video. You are the supervisor, and AI is the worker, but the final product is largely the worker's product, the machine's product. Why does this distinction matter? The main reason here is intellectual property. Laws vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. In the USA, where I'm based, the U.S. Copyright and Patent Office has ruled that AI-led content is ineligible for copyright. Copyright only applies to works created by humans, a precedent set in the court case in Naruto v. Slater in 2018. If the planned content is intended to be valuable, meaning you would enforce intellectual property rights if someone else you know, copied it and call your lawyers, then your work should be AI-assisted instead of AI-led. Here's a simple example to disambiguate this. If you ask a tool like Google Bard or ChatGPT to write you an outline for a blog post about marketing, and then you write the blog post, the finished work is human-led. AI may have assisted with the ideas, but the ideas themselves are they're ineligible for copyright anyway. You can't copyright ideas. The final work is human-made and thus can be copyrighted and protected. If you give ChatGPT an outline and tell it to write a blog post, the finished work is AI-led, and that means it is ineligible for copyright. A competitor or, you know, <laughs> some rando on the internet could take the work in whole and copy-paste it to their blog with no consequences because that work is not protected, at least under USA law. So that's the first test you need to ask. Second test is generative versus comparative. What kind of work are you asking AI to do? In general, today's generative AI tools are much better at comparative efforts than generative efforts. What does this mean? In my talk on AI, which uh, I'll link in the newsletter, I outlined six categories of tasks that generative AI, specifically large language models, but some of it does apply to image and audio generation as well, six tasks generative AI is good at. Summarization, extraction, rewriting, classification, question answering, and generation. Under the hood, when you strip away all the fancy words and all the hype about AI, these models are nothing more than just prediction engines. Yes, with extremely large data sets, they exhibit interesting emergent behaviors like some degree of mathematical reasoning and other tests of logic, passing the bar, etc. But these behaviors are simply the results of very large probability computations. When you type a prompt into ChatGPT or MidJourney, you are fundamentally just asking the model to predict the next thing you want it to do, the next word in the sequence, the next pixel in the image. Generative AI models, therefore, perform two fundamental types of operations, comparative and generative. Generative is when we ask for the next thing, the next word in the sentence, the image from a description, etc. Every time you ask one of these models to make something net new, you are doing generation. 
comparative tasks are when we give the model a word and ask it to compare it to what it predicts. We take a series of words and look them up in its probability tables and then highlight only the most important probabilities. In image work, it's when we ask a model to do in-painting or to recolor something or, or move your X from a photo, right? <clears throat> Why do models do better with comparative efforts than generative ones? <clears throat> because there's fundamentally less predicting. When you do comparisons, you're providing most, if not all, the data for the model to work with. <clears throat> if I ask a model to summarize this issue of the newsletter, I'm providing all the materials, all the data, and all it has to do is score each word, compare it to its internal property probabilities data set, <clears throat> and then return only a certain number of those probabilities. It doesn't have to make anything up. In human terms, in terms that we would use, <clears throat> the difference between generative and comparative is the difference between writing and editing. Which is easier for you, to get out a red pen and light a document on fire with it, or to stare at the gaping abyss of a blank page and that blinking cursor? Right? Many folks find editing easier, at least to get started, because there's already something there to work with, even if it's not very good. Machines are better at editing tasks too. Summarization, extraction, rewriting, classification. They're better at that than they are at, it, than they are at creating Right? That's just the way the models work. Prompts for editing, like summarize this article in 50 words or less, can be much, much shorter than prompts for writing because the machine doesn't need to predict anything new. It just needs to compare what's already there with what it knows. So that's the second test. If you're facing a task that is mostly editing, AI is usually a great choice. If you're facing a task that's mostly creating, AI might still be a good choice, but it's going to be a lot more effort to get a good result from it. Better prompts, more iterations, bigger model, etc. The last test we have to ask is whether or not what we want to create is commodity content or premium content. Commodity content is content that isn't particularly special. Right? It should communicate what we want to communicate, but the value it provides isn't in the way it's crafted. Right? Premium content is content that is special, that is valuable, that requires something like subject matter expertise or substantial skill to produce, and that premium has value. Again, because machines are just fundamentally predicting off of known probabilities, what they create is mathematically an average of what they've been trained on. As a result, they will always produce content that is inherently average. How good the content is depends on how specific the prompt is. The more specific and detailed your prompt, the more creative your work will be because it's an average of a smaller amount of data, right? Paint me a picture. It's real broad. It's going to be a, a very broad average. Paint a picture of a capybara wearing a baseball hat, smoking a cigarette, uh, and wearing tap shoes. That's a smaller set of data, so it's going to be more creative. So what's the difference between commodity content and premium content? Commodity content is exactly what it sounds like. Content that's a commodity, that's common, that's nothing special. Here's an example. Suppose I told you that this is a photo that I took in my hotel room of the painting on the wall, you know, the one over the bed. Is that believable? Would you believe me if I told you that? Of course. This, the hotel rooms are filled with images like this, this sailboat or, you know, here's one of uh, a picture of flowers, right? We've all stayed in a hotel like this. It's tasteful. It's inoffensive art. It may or may not move you, but it does the job of you know, breaking up the vast emptiness of the hotel room wall, maybe covering up some of those holes and other things on the wall. Is it valuable? Is it impactful? Does it move you? If you saw this painting in your hotel room and you knew you wouldn't get caught, would you steal it for your own home? Probably not, right? It's not terrible. It's not bad. It's it's just not amazing. It's okay, right? And you wouldn't know or care whether it was made by a person or a machine, right? If you walked into your hotel room and you saw that of a, an AI-generated painting on the wall, you'd be like, oh my God, I'm not staying here. That's outrageous. You can't have machine-generated art on the walls. That, that, that doesn't happen, right? <laughs> That's commodity content. Now, to be clear, both of these images are machine-generated, and you're probably... A, couldn't tell the difference if I put them in a hotel room, and B, you wouldn't care, right? The hotel room is the hotel room. is not the value. That is the essence of commodity content. It's content that's just okay. It's content that doesn't require a lot of care, per se, when you're creating it. We generate commodity content all day long. When we write emails to each other, hey, what's the status of that thing, right? When we post a memo in the office about not microwaving fish in the common area of microwave, we sit down and write our grocery list, those are tasks where the 
it's okay for the content to be a commodity. Premium content, on the other hand, is content that requires serious effort, serious thought, serious expertise. It's content that we know has value, has significance, has meaning to us. It is content that is uniquely ours and has to communicate very specific details in a way that only we can do. For example, I asked ChatGPT using the GPT-4 model, the most sophisticated model available to us, to write up some of the same points of view that I've just written in this newsletter. Here's what it had to say about commodity versus premium content. Lastly, but perhaps most importantly, is the value of the content. AI can generate volumes of content quickly, but quantity does not always equate to quality. For high-stakes content such as keynote speeches, brand positioning statements, or crisis communications, subtle nuances, and deep understanding of human emotion that a skilled copywriter brings to the table are irreplaceable. That is factually correct, but it lacks, um, well, me. Right? It lacks my voice, the unique way I communicate, and presumably at least part of the reason you read this newsletter in the first place. So this third test for when to use AI, that, that's it, right? It's the closer you are on a spectrum towards premium content, the less you should use AI. Can it help you brainstorm or critique what you've created? Sure. Should you have it right for you? With anything that requires deep skill or knowledge, probably not. not at, at least not with today's models. Apply the three tests, right? Those are the three questions I would ask before using generative AI for any content task. How important is it the result be copyrightable? How much of the task is comparative versus generative? And how premium is the resulting content? Having AI craft, say, diplomatic replies to random inbox pitches, great use of AI, right? It's totally a commodity task. Copyright's not an issue. And even though it's generative, quality doesn't matter after a certain point. Once it's factually correct, grammatically sound, and inoffensive, that's good enough to say, please stop pitching me this thing, right? Should you have AI write your wedding vows? Maybe not. I mean, be yourself, but maybe not. Should you have AI paint the decor for your hotel rooms if you run a hotel chain? It depends. It depends on how important the artwork is to the customer experience. If you're like every other hotel I've stayed at, AI is probably the way to go because... Who's going to know the difference anyway, right? But if you want to use art as a differentiator for your customer experience, then probably not, right? If you want your hotel to stand out and be different, the art had better be different too. So what else happened this week? Um, we are flogging the fact that Google Analytics is going to stop recording data in five days. Uh, so make sure you take the course. If you haven't taken the course, the link's in the newsletter. Uh, it is, uh, it, it, it's important. I have a YouTube video. <clears throat> That's the first link in the list here uh, on, for a tutorial on how to set up Google Analytics for menus to mirror those of Universal Analytics. It'll help make the transition easier for folks who are not accustomed to the new interface. So go check that out. Also got some stuff on the future of AI models, when to use generative AI in writing, etc. Uh, all sorts of stuff. Um, in other things, since we have jobs this week, analytics architect at Search Discovery, analytics engineer at Selfbook, data scientist for marketing analytics at Etsy, director of demand generation at Gigster, senior data scientist of marketing analytics at Etsy, senior manager of digital analytics at 8560, senior copywriter at Amerisource Bergen, senior director of communications, oh, digital communities at Green Biz Group, Vice President of Media and Connection Strategy at Collective Measures, Vice President of Demand Generation at AppFire, and VP of U.S. Strategy at Code.org. So lots of, uh, lots of people hiring. Um, quick ad, if you've, ha if you've enjoyed a lot of the AI talks I've been giving lately and you want to bring it to your company, there's a link for you how to, how to make that happen. What else is happening in the news this week? Uh, we have social media insights and Pinterest marketing from Sprout Social, YouTube insights into content consumption trends, uh, measurement roundtable on handling disinformation from the Institute of Public Relations, large contentful paint and page speed insights, four types of SEO keywords, open AI considering an app store for chat GPT. I well, yeah, pretty much saw that one coming a while ago. Uh, data labeling for improving machine learning efficiency. Quantum processors are beginning to provide utility beyond classical methods, which, by the way, if you want to know what the next big thing is, that's it. It's five to ten years away, so you, it's, it's not something that is, like, hot right now. But quantum computing is going to totally change all of computing, and it's going to dramatically change AI. But we got a ways to go before that happens. But I'm just telling you now, 
pencil it in, you know, 2028 to 2033, assuming we haven't blown ourselves up, <clears throat> quantum computing is going to be a really big deal. Upcoming events. I'll be at Maycon in, in Cleveland in July, followed by Content Jam, ISBM, Content Marketing World, and Marketing Analytics and Data Science all in September, all the same week. So it's going to be a busy week that week. Uh, and then the Marketing Prost BDB Forum in Boston in October. So if you have a chance to uh, to stop by and say hi to any of the, those events, please do. I'm always happy to, to, to wave and, uh, you know, stare at you awkwardly while I'm wearing the heavy mask that I wear. That is the news for this week. Thank you for tuning in, for giving me a few minutes of your time. I appreciate it. I hope you have a great week ahead. I'll talk to you soon. Take care. If you like this video, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. 